Welcome to the Microsoft Australian OEM Team webinar for Windows Server for January 2017. In this recording we'll be focusing on two primary topics here, the first one being a recap of the Windows Server 2016 editions differentiation and then moving on to some of the frequently asked licensing questions. Now these are topics that we've assembled based on some of the feedback we've been getting as we've finished up the National Roadshow as well as doing a number of webinars with our distribution partners both in person as well as uh, online webinars. So we've been getting a lot of questions, we've been seeing a lot of similar questions come through so we thought we'd try to get ahead of things and make life a little bit easier for you by explaining some of the differences so that you've got a better understanding of when it comes time to order new versions of Windows Server how you should have those conversations with your distributors. So first up, when we take a look at the, the different editions, it's not a huge difference here from a, an OEM perspective. We've still got Essentials Edition, which has had incremental updates, but really the important focus areas uh, that you need to be aware of is that uh, between Standard Edition and Data Center Edition, you'll notice now that we've got additional capabilities back in with Data Center again. Now, for those of you who did work with Data, Data Center Edition and Enterprise Edition prior to Server 2012, you would have uh, re you probably remember that it did actually have differentiate, differentiating features back in that time period. Um, but with Server 2012 and 2012 R2, they changed the model so that it was uh, feature parity between the different editions. But now with Data Center Edition, it's actually got additional features again. And if we take a look all up at what the differences are, First up in terms of the licensing in terms of cows, uh, they're both unlimited based on the number of cows that have been purchased. We'll talk about what requires a cow later on in the frequently asked questions. When it comes to the virtual machines, the, the base OEM licenses do cover you for uh, two virtual machines uh, on standard or unlimited VMs with data center edition. And uh, we'll talk about some of the impacts of the licensing changes and what they have on that in terms of the, uh, the CPU core requirements. Now, when it comes to Hyper-V containers, we've got two Hyper-V containers that we could use on standard edition versus unlimited Hyper-V containers. Now, we have covered Hyper-V containers and containers in general in previous um, video updates, but if you're not familiar with them, uh, do a quick search on the Oz OEM team blog site, and you'll find that we've done a, got a bit of information there as well as some useful links to take you out to really get up to speed around what a Windows Server container is versus a Hyper-V container and how they relate to some of the other container technologies that are out in the market. Now, that ties into unlimited Windows Server containers included here. Now, just to quickly give you an understanding of the container side, it's a way we can take a th thinner version of what it is we need to run without having to run it through the, you know, run it through Hyper-V or a virtualization platform completely. So instead of having to do the complete overhead of the the emulated hardware, the, emu the software that then runs on top of the operating system that runs on top of that, and then that application. It's how do we start packaging things up in, in much thinner, uh, lighter deployment packages. Now, Windows Server containers really give us the most flexibility in terms of really keeping it thin and light and quick to deploy. But by leveraging Hyper-V technologies with Hyper-V containers, it means we can get a lot of those benefits, but it also means that we start benefiting from the additional security that the additional layer of virtualization provides for us. Now, as we move on to the, the red box here, we've got three different areas in here. We've got storage capabilities, we've got networking, as well as shielded VMs and host guardian. So let's start off with the storage pieces. So with the storage pieces, really the big two differences here between data center edition and standard edition is that we've got technologies for that allow for storage replica. So to be able to do high speed, uh, 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 data replication between different Windows servers that might be in the same data center or even if you've got a high-speed connection you can do um, synchronous connectivity across uh, yeah, across those high-speed connections. If you've got slower connections uh, you can go through and you can start doing async connectivity um, so, or async uh, for your replication so that you can start really you know pushing a lot of data between different locations in a very very efficient manner. The second part of that is storage space is direct. So this is where we can start building, building out our file server clusters, uh, but starting to really leverage some of the new capabilities that we've got included with the, you know, the latest hardware advances. So being able to leverage not just SSDs and you know, things like SAS, for example, but also things like NVMe devices. So very, very high speed performance, as well as uh, for workloads that require incredibly high IOPS, also the ability to support those. 
with the networking stack, this is taking a lot of the concepts of the Azure networking uh, options and bringing them down into a Windows Server environment. So we get a, a centralized network controller where we can go through and do centralized uh, management and control of things like uh, firewall settings, network adapters, whether they're virtual or physical, for example, and really do that from one central location. And the final ones, shielded virtual machines and host guardian service, this is where we can go through and start configuring our virtual machines so that uh, we can start abstracting them from the uh, from the hardware, or sorry, from the uh, the infrastructure they're running on top of. So just because someone's got admin privileges at the the virtualization level doesn't necessarily mean that they should be get, should be able to see what's happening inside of that uh, inside of that VM that's running. Now, probably the the best type of example for this is if you've got a virtual machine running with a a, a, a hosting provider. You want them to be able to manage things around your VM, but you don't necessarily want them working inside of your VM. And this is one of the technologies that allows you to do that. And working alongside the host guardian service, it means that you can set up a trusted network fabric where all of these different pieces can come together and allow you to, you know, to move the shielded VMs, do load balancing, etc., um, without them sort of having running into issues because they're run, moving across to a different network host. So. When we take a look at the feature differentiations in this slide, you know, we get a slightly different view of some of those same pieces that we just spoke about. But really the important messages here is if we take a look at the, the descriptions on the left hand side. Standard and Data Center, they continue to deliver enhancements to the core Windows Server functionality and they make modern app development features accessible. So this means that uh, they've got support for Nano Server built in. Now what's important to note here with Nano Server is when, once you do start using Nano Server in a production environment, you do need to have software assurance applied to the servers that Nano Server is being deployed onto. So that's a very important uh, note to understand with this. Now with Data Center Edition, Really the focus here continues to be what we've seen in the past with data center, which is it's really about those workloads where people have got incredibly high density virtualization requirements. So for someone just looking to run a handful of virtual machines, data center, you know, it's, you know, you've got to start doing the maths around when it actually starts making sense from a cost per VM perspective. So, you know, so taking a look at what's the cost of uh, a standard license, including two VMs versus the cost of a data center license and start figuring out what makes sense from the VM, the per VM cost for you, uh, depending on what uh, licensing program you're purchasing through. Now, what also starts complicating things a little bit here with the data center piece now is, is that you do need to also take into account you know, those additional features that we just mentioned. So if they are features that you need, it doesn't really matter what data center, you know, what other require, what other capabilities of data center around virtualization rights, et cetera, are required. Because if you need the, you know, the software defined uh, data center, the networking stack, the shielded VMs, for example, they are only, a P, only included as part of data center. So a lot of uh, duplication on this slide, but just really to reiterate that, you know, a lot of similarities between the two, but once you do start moving up and having more advanced requirements, uh, data center is going to give you additional flexibility there. So let's go through now and take a look from the licensing perspective, what some of the differences here are. So first up, if we take a look at the uh, data center and standard at the top, these are both based on per core licensing. So We've covered this in quite a lot of detail in previous uh, recordings, so no doubt it will be something that we revisit again in the future, but this, this month we're keeping that one on the back burner, and we'll talk about some of the core requirements in the frequently asked questions, but not in the core part of the, the presentation. Now, the requirements here are that you do need to buy Windows Server Cows for either Windows Server 2016 data center or Windows Server 2016 standard users or devices, the same way that you have been for Windows Server 2012 R2 and earlier. Now for Server 2016 Essentials, then like the previous editions, it's got support for up to 25 users and 50 de devices, and it's just processor based and there are no CAL requirements for that. So otherwise, yeah, so there have been some new introductions, things like Windows Server Multipoint Premium Server, which requires you to start doing things like um, adding additional uh, terminals per uh, for the server, but really that's a little bit of out, a little bit outside of scope of the OEM conversation. But I just thought I'd include that and storage server on here so that you can see that there are a number of different options that are are available to you. So as we keep going through now, if we take a look at the frequently asked licensing questions from OEM and system builder partners. 
the thing that's really important to note before we continue on here is that these are questions that are specifically targeting the licensing for OEM product bought through OEM or system builder. So direct OEM or channel OEM product. If you're purchasing through volume license programs, some of the information here may not necessarily apply in the same way. So please don't try to apply this information to uh, volume license programs unless you go through and check with your volume licensing specialist beforehand. So with that out of the way, let's jump in now and first of all talk about some of the common questions we get around the core licensing changes. So this is where we've moved from per, per CPU licensing across to per core base licensing with Windows Server 2016. So the first one, if I disable physical cores at the hardware level, do I need to license them for Windows Server 2016? And the answer for this one is no, it's only those which, you've enabled, which are enabled in the hardware. So in general, if someone says they want to disable cores to reduce software licensing costs, that would make me raise an eyebrow and really question what's going on. Uh, but when it's because it's not really going to be that much more to enable all the cores, especially considering you've paid for that uh, level of hardware. But for people who need to have CPUs that operate within a certain power envelope, or maybe you want to disable a certain number of cores to allow the other cores to run at a higher frequency uh, for higher time periods, for example, there are definitely reasons that you may want to disable physical cores. Now, important to note here that it's, you know, it's really what's, what's being exposed from the firmware or the BIOS to the, to the operating system is what you need to calculate that core count on. And we'll talk about a few more of the things that tie into that. And this is one of the ones that comes up all the time, which is does hyperthreading impact core count? And the answer to that is no. Hyperthreading, you know, a core that's got that is presented as two threads or two, uh, two hyper hyper sorry um, hyperthreaded cores, that it doesn't count as two cores towards Windows Server. If you've got an eight core, sixteen thread CPU, for example, that's an eight core CPU. So you need to license for the eight cores, not for the uh, not for the the number of um, hyperthreading uh, yeah, the you know the number of CPUs that are uh, presented in Task Manager, for example, through hyperthreading. So just remember, it's just the physical cores. So you know you'll see you know your eight, ten, twelve type uh, numbers there. If my new single or dual socket server purchase includes more than 16 cores, what low OEM licensing options will be available to license the additional cores? So one of the things that's important to note, and you'll find that uh, I've got a link to this included with the, uh, the links through to this uh, recording, so you should be able to dig this one up pretty easily, is we've actually got a number of different um, OEM license types available now, depending on how many CPU cores you need, as well as what kind of reassignment rights are required. But if the server's got more than 16 cores but less than 24 cores, you can buy the 16 core license plus enough additional core licenses to cover you. And basically you just keep adding two or four additional core packs to bring you up to speed. Now if you've got greater than 24 cores, well one of the other options that's available is a 24 core base license. So this would cover you with a on a dual sockets um, standard server for example, uh, with uh, two 12-core Xeons in there, um, yeah, just to use those as an, as, a, as an example. Now, once you go above 24, well, basically you have to do the same thing as what we did in the previous example. You need to buy the base license with 24, and then for each additional core that you need to license, you need to make sure that you've got additional number of core packs uh, uh, that you can then add on for that. So it's just a matter of you know, making sure that you do have the appropriate number of cores covered. Now this is another one that comes up, it gets asked in various ways, so hopefully um, you know, this is something that you've been thinking about and wondering how it applies. But what if I'm running Windows Server 2016 on top of a virtualization platform such as Hyper-V? Well, this question comes in multiple variations as I mentioned. So one of the variations is what if I'm only exposing you know, X number of threads to the virtual machines, for example. And it's a matter of, it doesn't really matter what you're setting inside of the virtual machines. It's what's being exposed to, to the base operating system or the base hypervisor. So regardless of whether you're using Windows Server with Hyper-V, if you're using standalone Hyper-V, if you're using Nano Server, if you're using uh, one of the VMware offerings here, it doesn't really matter what the virtualization solution is. It's what's being exposed at the hardware level that needs to be licensed. So in this case for Windows server, it needs to be the number of CPU cores as we've previously discussed. So 
just to sort of highlight what the comment here is, is that running on top of a virtualization platform doesn't affect the required core licensing for Windows Server, regardless of how many cores are exposed to the virtual machines versus, versus those being exposed to the virtualization platform. So it doesn't matter if someone says, I've got a 22 core server, but I'm only exposed, or sorry, 24 core server, but I'm only exposing eight cores to the VMs. Uh, yeah, I've got two VMs each running two cores each, sorry, four cores each. That's, you know, that calculation is irrelevant in terms of what's actually required from a licensing perspective. It's what's being exposed from the hardware side. Now, what error will you see if the server core count is not licensed correctly? Well, this is like Windows Server Cal licensing, where it's not going to alert you that you've got something mislicensed. Um, because it doesn't know that you've, you haven't actually gone out and purchased additional um, cores for ex core licenses, for example, the same way that it doesn't know that you've gone out, whether or not you've gone out and bought additional um, CALs, for example. So that's something where you need to make sure that at time of purchase, you are having the right conversation with your distributor. So now let's move on and have a quick conversation around CALs. So do Windows Server CALs cover the user or device across the entire Active Directory forest? or the physical server or just a virtual instance. And generally, you know, the advice here is, is you buy you buy per user or device within the organization. And then that way it doesn't matter how many servers that you've got on your network, um, you know, how, you know, physical, virtual, um, you know, one, you know, that one cal covers that user or that device to access anything on the network. What services require a Windows Server Cal? So it's a great follow-up question. And effectively, you know, the best way to answer it is that if a user or a device uses a service or accesses software on Windows Server, it requires a Cal. This includes, but is not limited to, Active Directory, DNS, and DHCP, for example. Now, the reason why I put on the DNS and DHCP example, for example here, um, was because sometimes people say, but what if I'm only getting an IP address? What if I'm only doing this? What if I'm only doing that? And part of this is based on some of the conversations I have with people where, you know, in some parts of the channel, there's still, you know, some misunderstandings that if you're not logging in against Active Directory that you don't need client access licenses. And that's not the case at all. It's, you know, regardless of what services Windows Server is providing, you do need to have uh, the CALs for those users or those devices. Do you need to purchase CALs if your domain controller is server essentials and you have a second copy of standard for other resources? And yes, you do need to buy Windows Server CALs for that second Windows Server because the Windows Server Essentials license doesn't cover you for the additional Windows Server uh, Cal, CAL options there. And you know, it's it's one of those things where you know when you get the CALs included with uh, with essentials, uh, so you know, then basically allowing you to, to drop on Windows Server and not have to pay for extra CALs doesn't really make sense. But where this question tends to come from is those people who may have been working with small business server in the past, where if they if they dropped a second Windows Server standard onto an SBS network, they didn't need to buy uh, a client access license for, or for that server. But in this case, it was because the, you know, in that case, because you had to buy your CALs for SBS. Whereas with Windows Server Essentials, the CALs are included with that base price up to those 25 users. So it's a different product, it's not SBS, and it's not licensed the same way as SBS. So moving on now to Nano Server. Now, this was one of the things I touched upon briefly um, in the overview section at the beginning, but does Nano Server require software assurance? And you can, if you're just using it in dev and test, you don't need software assurance on Nano Server. But as soon as you deploy Nano Server in a production environment, uh, it needs to have software assurance um, applied. So you need to make sure that, you know, remember that with software assurance, it needs to be purchased within 90 days of you p acquiring your OEM license. Um, so make sure that you are taking that into account when you are talking to customers who are looking at some of the workloads that Nano Server can handle. And again, you know, we've covered Nano Server in detail in previous recordings, so I won't spend too much time on it here today. Now, moving on to one of my favorites, downgrade rights. So how can I license a Windows Server 2016 host but run 2012 R2 virtual machines? Well, if you buy a Server 2016, you could run that as the virtualization platform, and then you can exercise the downgrade rights on those VMs. So that way you get the, you know, the latest and greatest uh, infrastructure for virtualization running on top of Hyper-V 2016 um, with Windows Server 2016, but still be able to run your 
you know, your, your existing applications, etc., that might require Windows Server 2012 R2. Now, what's important to note when you do exercise downgrade rights with virtual machine or exercising downgrade rights in general with Windows Server is that it's an end user right and the end user has to supply the media and the product key. Microsoft or the distributor or the reseller partner are not involved in that. That is something that the, it, the customer is expected to have access to those. If they don't have access to those and they need them, um, they need to apply software assurance. And then one of the benefits of software assurance is it grants people access to previous versions of uh, the software and the product keys. Can we use Windows Server 2016 CALs for 22R2 installs? And yes, no problem whatsoever doing that. Um, and if it's if the conversation changes to be, you know, a remote desktop server cal question, um, even though they're not available through OEM, you know, we still end up getting a lot of questions on RDS cals in the OEM team. So what's important to note with RDS cals is that you will need to go through the the licensing clearinghouse in order to do that. And as I said, okay, I jumped the gun a little bit with this one, but um, yeah. So what the reason why you need to go through the clearinghouse here is is because uh, RDS CALs are, are something that require a product key and the product keys generally for a new version of Windows won't work against an old version of Windows. So that's why you need to go through the clearinghouse and they'll walk you through that process very, very easily. Um, it's not time consuming, it's not complicated, so it's not something that you really should be too concerned about. And why would you purchase a new version of Windows if you already have an existing key and media for the version that you need to use? Well, this question came up in one of the webinars that we ran previously, and it's really a matter of understanding what type of license is running underneath the operating system, or is running the operating system. So if this was an OEM license that was purchased previously, um, the chances are it didn't include reassignment rights unless the customer added software assurance to it within that 90 day window. So your typical OEM software it's not forward transferable over to new hardware. However, there have been some updates to certain Windows Server SKUs. So if you've got buying Windows Server SKUs that do include the term reassignment in their, in their product name, they do include some reassignment rights. So it's not saying that all OEM products are going to be transferable moving forward, but there are a limited set of those that are available right now. And in the link through to this uh, recording, you should see some resources that will explain what some of those things are, just to really try to get you up to speed on those. And we've also covered those in depth in previous recordings as well. So now moving on finally to reassignment rights, which I just covered off um, quickly then, but do you have to buy reassignment rights at initial purchase or can they be bought afterwards? So you can't add reassignment rights to a product you already own unless you are adding software assurance to that product. If you do want reassignment rights right from the beginning with Windows Server Data Center, you can buy Data Center with reassignment rights through OEM. And for the after point of sales SKUs of Windows Server, you could also buy those they also do come with reassignment rights. Now, just a base Windows Server standard license, for example, um, you can't get reassignment rights on that base license. It's only the after point of sale or with a base data center license that you can get reassignment rights right out the gate. So now moving over to virtualization. This question, the question itself here really isn't the important piece. What the, the I guess the general question here is, is when we do talk about Windows Server Standard, including the right for two virtual machines, that's for two virtual machines of Windows Server Standard. Now, that's not saying that you can't run other virtual machines. So in this case, someone's asking, well, you know, can I run three VMs on one host? And look, Windows Server's not going to, Windows Server Standard is not going to prevent you from running, you know, lots of different virtual machines at once. It's assuming that you've got the appropriate licenses for anything over and above the two Windows Server standard instances that you do run there. So if you've got additional instances that you've purchased that you've had, um, you know, that you've migrated from other hardware with appropriate license rights, for example, then you can definitely move them over and run more than two. But just remember, they need to be appropriately licensed prior to and after the move. Now, we'll wrap up just with some quick resources before we finish up today's recording. So upcoming events early next year, we've got Microsoft Ignite Australia. Um, the 14th to the 17th of February on the Gold Coast. So definitely an event that I'd recommend if you haven't been to that and you really need to learn a lot about Windows Server and other Microsoft technologies. And the other one, for those of you who are Sydney-based, we've got the 
A Windows 10 slash Enterprise Mobility Exam Readiness Session happening in late February in the Microsoft Sydney office. Now this is a, a trial event that we're doing, that's why we're only doing one city right now. Um, but if you are interested, contact us on the details over on the, the next screen. Um, so on the next slide, I'll cover off how you contact us. But there are going to be some, you know, some specific requirements we do put in place for this because it's a pilot. Um, we want to make sure that we've got people who we, you know, who have done, you know, a bit of preparation work already, have already done certain qualifi qualifying exams. And once we lock in all the details, I'll make sure those details go up on the Australian blog site. So here's the Australian blog site. So blogs.technet.microsoft.com. So keep an eye on that. Um, and you'll see that the new information around uh, anything OEM related will go up there. We've got the OEM Server AU pre-sales uh, uh, pre -sales alias there for you to contact us on. And we've also got the revamped Microsoft Smart HQ. So microsoftsmarthq.com.au where you can go to get a lot of information on Windows, Office and server products as well as different Windows 10 devices. So that brings us to the end of today's recording. So thank you very much for tuning in and if you've got any questions feel free to reach out to us through one of the mechanisms that you see listed here and we'll be more than happy to get back in contact with you.